You know, we all got uh, those favorite verses in the Bible that we uh, read once and they just sort of stick with us. Sometimes people call them life verses. And one of them for me is Psalm 37.4. You guys know that one? It's one of the famous Psalms. Delight yourself in the Lord and He will what? There you go, you know it. Give you the desires of your heart. So what this obviously implies is that all people have desires. That every heart and every person that has existed amongst every individual that's walked on the face of this earth has had desires. You all have desires. They could be bad desires. They could be good desires. But all of us, to some degree, have desires. We all have needs that we think we would love to see fulfilled. In some cases, we'd give anything to get a specific desire met. Even as a little kid, you know, we always had those dreams, and maybe it was just me, but you, you dream that like the, the genies, I, drew, I grew up in the I dream of genie age, and uh, that, like, that was real. Like, like I'm going to walk along a beach, and I'm going to find a lamp someday, and I could tell I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I would rub it, and a genie would come out, and a genie would grant me three wishes, right? And then we get older, and we realize, well, that's not going to happen. And then you talk about people on the streets today, and they believe in good luck. They do certain things that are going to bring them good luck to hopefully allow their desires to be met, or, or good karma. You hear that a lot as well. Most people, even if you're not into wasting your money on the lottery, we still fantasize. I mean, pretty much every other believer does about winning the lottery. You win the lottery, millions of dollars. You can pretty much do whatever you want. Probably every desire you have, you could then purchase. Or inheriting a fortune from some unknown relative. Or how about going through like grandma's attic? As a little kid, I'd be like going through grandma's dusty attic and sifting through stuff and finding a 1910 mint condition Harness Wagner baseball card. It'd be like, a dream come true. We all have desires. We want our desires granted. That's what Psalm 37, 4 teaches. And quite oftentimes, most people, especially adults, see God somewhere in there as the solution. That if I get my life right with God, I'll get what I want. If I pray to God, He'll give me what I want. God will grant me the desires of my heart. As a matter of fact, there's an entire theological belief system out there, is there not? that says God exists to give you what you want. God wants you, in a worldly sense, happy. God lives to meet your desires, whatever they are. God is not about bending your will. Your job is to name it and claim it, which means you bend God's will to give you what you want. He's the slot machine in the sky. He's Santa Claus. He is the big genie that comes out of the, the bottle then. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Clearly, God promises in Psalm 37, 4 to give us the desires of our heart. But what is that conditioned by? The first part of the verse that people oftentimes omit, that we must what? Delight ourselves in the Lord. You see, when we delight ourselves in God, when God is our delight, when God comes first place in the way we do life, we will naturally desire the things that God desires. And our desires are not in a worldly sense or a bad sense or a mundane sense. Now we desire the things that are most important. We desire what God desires. And when Jesus says, if we can ask anything, He will hear us and answer us because we are asking then according to the will of God and not our will. His answer might be, not yet. But He will hear us and He will answer those prayers. What do you desire? I know for all of you, you desire something. Even, sadly, guys who jump off bridges desire to die. Everyone desires something. What do you desire? Now, you know the Sunday school answers. But that aside, 
If you're honest with yourself, what do you really desire? Stock market goes up. So your 401k increases in value. I mean, springtime is coming, green grass in your front yard. More likes on your Facebook page. Maybe an upcoming movie. Maybe losing weight. I'm not saying those are necessarily bad things. They're okay. It's okay to desire to lose weight. It's okay to desire to have a decent looking lawn. Those aren't bad. But are those the ultimate desires we should have? They may be good desires, but are they the best desires? What desires does God want you to have? In other words, if you delight in God, is he saying, hey, seriously, man, get going on the fertilizer pretty soon, man. And it's not just one time a year. I mean, this is seasonal. Let's go. Let's go. Get your kids out on Saturday. Start pulling those dandelions. That's a good desire. If you delight in God, what desires is he putting on your heart? What are the best desires? How about things like this? That God's reign would be visible. Do you really desire that? How about every knee bowing to Christ? How about people just coming to know Christ? How about better communion with Jesus? How about Satan vanquished? How about no longer battling sin? The war is over. How about a resurrected body? How about perfect unity amongst Christians? How about God reclaiming the earth? How about God's revealed will always done on earth as it is in heaven? Those are the best desires. And I can promise you, the more you delight in God, that will be the passion of your heart. If, you, if I'm speaking a foreign language to you, you're not delighting in God. You're delighting in Aladdin or something like that. I don't know. Now, the problem with those desires, I think, is pretty straightforward. We desire them, and we don't often get them. I want to see every knee bow and confess Christ. But it's not happening. I'm sick of battling sin. I feel like Paul in Romans 7, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I do, I don't do. I should do, I don't do. I don't see God's visible reign. I don't have a resurrected body yet. I got a body that's breaking down. So all these things that I'm desiring, to some degree when I come to Christ, I'm experiencing, yes. But I'm not fully getting them in their full consummation. But you see, the goal is the more we desire them and we don't get them, we don't give up, but we begin to desire them all the more. The more you want it, the more you want it, the more you want it. And these are good desires because God promises to answer these desires. But these desires will not be fully realized until Jesus comes back. The second coming. All these good desires on our hearts will be realized when Christ returns. And that's why the second coming is a theme that is stressed throughout the scriptures. So we want those things. The easiest way to get them is to pray that Jesus comes back. And we pray that Jesus will return. And I've been doing it for 25 years. And here I am to say, he hasn't come back yet. You ever pray for something for 25 years and it hasn't happened? You start getting doubts? You start feeling like you're wasting your time? You ever tell someone else you're praying that Christ returns and they think you're nuts? Even in the church? And they start ridiculing you and Jesus? The Apostle Peter dealt with this very issue in a very candid way. 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, you can turn there if you want briefly. He speaks to this situation. I mean, he's been waiting a few months maybe, a few years. We've been waiting 2,000 years. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, that's where we're living today, mockers will come with their mocking, following after their own lusts and saying, listen to this, where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, Peter says, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years. It hasn't been 2,000 years for Jesus. It's been two days in a sense. And a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise. 2,000 years sounds pretty slow to me, but Peter says what? As some count slowness. And the Lord's timetable is not slow. But He is what? Patient. Toward you. Not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Jesus, according to the Bible, is coming back. And as we learned last week in 1722 to 37, he will come back to judge those who have rejected him. And he will come back to rescue those who have received him. He came the first time, he says in John, not to judge the world, but to save the world. We saw that last week in 1725. He must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He came to pay the penalty for our sin at Calvary. He's not coming as the Lamb of God the second time. He's coming as the Lion of Judah. He's coming 1724 last week like lightning in the sky. And there will be verse 27 and 29, destruction. And there will be 36, 34 to 36, deliverance. So if this is all good, why is he waiting so long? Because as we read from 2 Peter, he is very, very patient. And he's waiting maybe for you to repent, Peter says, and give your life to Christ. If you are without Christ and Jesus comes back today, you're in big trouble. <laughs> and God is patient with you potentially. Saying, come to Christ. Because I'm coming back. Come to Christ. Because He does not desire amongst His elect that any of them perish. So that's the whole sermon. We haven't even got to the passage yet. That's the whole thing. I could technically go home right now. But I want to kind of do it a little different today. Kind of give you the whole purpose. And now I want to support it with the text. Here we go. First point. I'm simply calling the point. Look at verse 1. Jesus is about to teach us He's going to also give us in verse 1 the main point of this sermon. And that is simply this. Do not lose heart when praying for His return. Look at verse 1 now. Now he's telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. So the parable will explain this, but this verse in a sense is grounding what he is getting at. The main point is to show us that when you pray for His return, verse 1, don't lose heart. Don't quit. Don't give up. I was telling first service, if I could do one sermon, sometimes I just like, like to do like, you know, like the toxic people sermon that you liked. I, I, like, I just got these things in my heart that I sometimes just like to preach. Um, if I could do one sermon right now, like out of context of Luke, I would love to do a sermon on God's people persevering. I remember when I first started teaching in the public schools, I was 23, 1988, right out of college. 
And I remember starting, I was at an elementary school teaching physical education, and I got to know the principal real well, an older, seasoned, veteran guy, and I said, you know, tell me about teachers and, and if they get better or worse, whatever have you. He goes, let me tell you something, Randy. He goes, I've been doing this for a long time. When it comes to the skill of a teacher, most teachers reach their maximum capacity in terms of excellence by their third year. I'm like, wait a second. You got some ladies here that have been like, like 40 years doing elementary school. As I know, most teachers reach their max by year three. What does that mean? They come in, they work hard, it's a new deal, it's a thrill, they're excited, they're learning new things, and then they kind of just put it into cruise control, and either they plateau, or they start going back down again. I found that very surprising. I think many Christians do the same thing, though. You know who are the most zealous believers oftentimes? The folks that just get saved. Isn't there something, I mean, this honeymoon. Can you imagine if your marriage worked that way? When's the greatest time you have with your spouse? Oh, our honeymoon, that was the best. You've been married 35 years, I know. It's been bad ever since. It makes no sense. You should say after 35 years, our marriage has never been better. I would think. And people do the same thing with Jesus. They come in, they get saved. They're, they're like, oh man, I'm learning so much. And they're just eating it up and they're trying to figure it all out. And they're coming to all the Bible studies and they're, they're participating. And then all of a sudden you get to a point where it's like, all right, I kind of got this. Cruise control. Plateau. When you plateau with Jesus, you're actually black, backsliding. You know that. When it comes to your spiritual life, are you persevering with Jesus? Are you still growing with the Lord? Is there still a fire in your soul? I would think the longer you walk with Jesus, the more that fire is being stoked, right? And one of the first things to go and we start backsliding is prayer. That's why we repeatedly read in the Bible, persevere in your prayer Pray continually. Keep your prayer in the forefront as one of your primary spiritual disciplines. And I think if we examine our prayer life, we need to ask ourselves, is it getting better or is it getting worse? I am sad to say that I might have been more zealous for prayer when I got saved than maybe than I am right now, and there's something wrong with that. Corporate prayer, same thing. Now again, I'm not trying to guilt anyone to come out on Wednesday night. If you can't make it, you can't make it. If you don't want to be here... Don't show up. But again, if we're not coming, why not? I've seen this a lot. 20 years of doing it at the church. Usually it's a, a couple, they come to the church, they start coming out, they start coming out, and all of a sudden, it's like, then it's like twice a month, and then it's once a month, and then you don't see them anymore. It's never the other way around. Almost never. I never have had a couple that have been here like five years and say, you know what, Randy? We've been praying about it. We need to start coming to prayer meeting. Rarely do I see that. It's the opposite. Just giving up. Why do we do that in prayer? Why does prayer all of a sudden just become optional? Or maybe even a waste of time? Coming back on Wednesday nights is a waste of my time. Why? Do we not believe what Jesus said about prayer? Satan would love nothing more than to see us not praying. We feel it's just, you know, I've been praying and I don't see results. I, I feel the same way, folks. I went to the vine, we prayed for all these things, and that lady still has cancer. I did baptisms, I didn't see another new person other than some kids in our church getting baptized. I'm just, I'm just tired of praying for these things that don't seem like my prayers are making a difference. It's hard. It's work. It is work to pray. Repeat, as I said, reading the Bible, persevering in prayer. Keep at it. 18.1 is a call to persevere in prayer. But let's be specific. The context is not a general perseverance in prayer. The context here specifically is persevering in praying for what? In particular. The Lord's return. So let me ask you, I said this was going to be convicting. When's the last time you prayed for Jesus to come back? How often are you praying for it? 
I think for many of us, myself included, I think we're sometimes fine if, if he just kind of holds off on the return. Because life is pretty good. If we were being persecuted because we lived in a Middle Eastern country, I mean, we'd be praying like, any second, Lord, please rescue us. Right now, I'm like, hope I see my kids get married. Hope I can enjoy somewhat of a retirement, maybe. Spend more time with my wife. I don't want to go yet. Life's good. Life is good. See, grandkids? I'm not dying to get to heaven in a sense. There's something wrong with that. Have we lost heart? Have we ever had the heart to pray for Jesus' return? This is all over the Bible. Jesus. And he said to them, when you pray, saying, Father, hallowed be your name, pray, your kingdom come. That's the Lord's prayer. Paul, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. 2 Timothy 4.8, Paul says we should be loving his appearing. The writer of the Hebrews speaks about those who eagerly await Christ's return, 9.28. Peter speaks of looking for and hastening the coming day of God. And John in Revelation says, he who testifies to these things says, yes, I am coming quickly, amen, come Lord Jesus. Are you Titus 2.13 Longing for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Verse 1 is very simple. If you desire God, your desires should be this stuff, and the key to unlock all that stuff for you is the return of Christ. You should be praying for it. And you shouldn't lose heart even though for many of us it's been decades and it hasn't happened yet. Now, we could stop right there. But Jesus is so gracious and he's going to give us hope. He's going to give us hope. Okay, I can say just go do that. But let me, let me give you encouragement. That's what Jesus does now. And at the second point, he gives this parable. And it's going to illustrate the main point with the parable in verses 2 to 5. Don't lose heart. Why, Jesus? Jesus says, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Okay? Now, before I get into the parable, let me just very briefly give you a little cultural background to help you make sense of this thing. There are two players. There's a judge and there's a, a widow. The way it worked back in Israel in the first century, and even prior to that, was when you elected judges, they were to be men of integrity. Second Chronicles 19, 6 to 7. They were to be good men. They were to be impartial. They were men that didn't take bribes. Men that were compassionate. Men that were righteous. Men that were God-honoring. Those are the kind of guys that were to judge Israel. But, but even like today, even though that's the ideal standard that we'd all still agree to, there, every once in a while some bad eggs get in there. And this guy was really bad. He was the opposite of everything a good judge should be. And then he got this widow, and back then during biblical times, women had really no power. They were really helpless. Most of them did not learn trades. There was a lousy, for the most part, welfare system, not like it is today. And if a widow did not have a man to take care of her, she would probably die. The only hope they had was what the Word of God provided for them. You know, God says, I, I am merciful to the orphan and to the alien and to the widow, and you should be as well. All right, so here's the story, fictitious story, parable. It's going to teach us a spiritual lesson, though, beginning in verse 2. In a certain city, we don't know where that city was. He's just making up a story here. Jesus says there's a judge. He's described as not fearing God and not respecting man. Bad guy. I love when Jesus tells his stories. He always goes to extremes, right? Like the prodigal son. Extremes. How that prodigal son went out. I mean, it was the extreme of things that even the, the Pharisees and the Jews of his day could not imagine Jesus was even saying. They're probably like, Jesus, stop it already. This is crazy that any kid would do this to his dad and then eat pig's food and, and then a dad would receive him back. I mean, there's no way that would happen. Worst guy anybody can imagine for a judge. 
Ignore the greatest commandment to love God with all your heart. Ignore the second greatest commandment to love people. This was a bad guy. This was a, a godless man, a very callous man, hard-hearted man. And another reason I know that is because he affirmed that of himself in verse 4. He said, yeah, I mean, if he was standing here right now, he'd be like, yeah, that's me. You just described me perfectly. That's who I am. I don't care. This is a bad judge. Verse 3, there's also a widow, and she's in the city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection for my opponent. Now, anybody here in this story in the first century is saying this lady's got zero chance of getting any help from a guy like this. No way. She's got no hope. There's no hope. If he is the, like the meanest guy that you can present, this lady is like the most helpless lady you can present. If he accepted a bribe, she didn't have the means to even round up the money to pay him off. She wants legal protection. See, so what's that? Well, we don't know. We know she's a widow. She wants legal protection. So most likely she lost her husband. And there was a financial settlement that was, that was due her, rightly so, and she wasn't getting that. I did a little research on this. The way it worked back then was when a man died and he left a woman behind, she would not just automatically inherit his estate like we have it today. But yet there was means within the law where a portion of his estate would be rationed to her, almost like, um, like an alimony or child support type thing. Where, 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 where she, because she would basically die if she was left out in the street without any male protection, would be given some kind of money to keep her alive to pay for her living expenses. This money was due her. She wasn't asking for something that was not owed her. This money was not fringe. It was necessary for her survival. So the picture is, this lady is in total desperation. She needs this money. And she's standing in the face of gross injustice right now. But verse 3 says what? I think it's in the imperfect tense, which is a continuous action of the verb. She just kept coming. She kept coming. Court opens. This was a male-dominated world. Women oftentimes did not go to court. They would not be seen in a court. That's where the guys hung out. And on her own, without a man, she would venture, you get this appearance like every single day, a lot of courage to do this into the public courts, repeatedly and relentlessly plead her case. She just kept coming. She just kept coming every day. Go up and shop. He looks out the window. There she is again. Get out of here. I don't care about you. I don't want to hear your case. Get her out of here. Comes back and there she is, waiting in line. Before a judge that is callous. Before a judge that is wicked. Verses 4 and 5. For a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, kind of again like the, like the prodigal son, right? Like, my dad's slaves get better treatment than what I'm dealing with right now. Maybe I should go back and ask for his forgiveness. The judge is having this soliloquy as well. Even though, I love this, I don't fear God. That's not the issue. I don't respect man. That's not the issue either. Yet, she bothers me. She's bothering me. And because she bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by her continually coming, she's going to wear me out. The judge is not righteous. He's not a hero in this story. Without any shame, he says of himself in verse 4 that he doesn't fear God. He doesn't respect man. But yet, the judge, put your thinking caps on, does rule in favor to give this woman legal protection. Verse says, is it because he cares about justice, I ask you? No. Is it because he is compassionate? No. 
Is it because he wants to honor God? Because he's accountable to God and he wants to do the right thing before God? No. He acts according to this text for one reason and one reason alone. And what is that? To just get rid of her. To get her to shut up. To get this lady out of his life. This is not a righteous thing. He is still acting not in her best interest or the law's best interest, but in his own selfish interest, right? This is what's best for me. This is how I can have a better life. I'll give you what you want. Now get out of here, would you? And she would just come every day. She pleaded her case. Until finally he broke. She wore him out. And he gave her what she wanted. Now, what does that have to do with prayer? Can you draw any conclusions? Things that jump out at me. She believed in her cause. She was relentless. She was persistent with her request. She did not grow weary. And as a result, she got what she wanted. Now, here's the point that a lot of sermons go really bad. What's the point of the story? Here's what it is, Pastor. I got it. It makes sense to me. If God's the judge and I'm the widow, and um, if I keep praying and keep praying, God's got bigger things to do than to deal with my little puny problems. He's a stingy God. And, and if I keep praying, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll wear God out. Yeah, I'll just keep praying and I'll drive him nuts. I'll wear him out. And then finally he's going to be like, just get out of the Holy of Holies here. Go on your way. I'll give you what you want. Get out of my hair. Here's the moral of the story. Does that work for you? I guarantee you'll find a lot of sermons on the internet that say that. Does that work for you? That's why you have to have a good theology, folks. Because if you're going to compare God to that judge, that's not the God that I know. Not at all. Do you want a God whose will you can bend? That's not even a good mom or dad. Do you want a God that says, God, if I bug you enough, will you finally give me what I want? Is that a wise, loving, heavenly father? Do you want a God that acts out of frustration? All right, finally, get out of here. Not a holy God. Not a wise God. Not a loving God. If God acts that way, he is just like the unrighteous judge. Here's the point. Here's the point. If a wicked judge, a wicked judge can respond to a persistent plea from a useless, I'm not saying she's useless, he's saying she's useless, useless widow. If a wicked judge can respond to a persistent plea from, in his estimation, a useless widow, how much more will a loving God respond to the cries of his people who have been purchased with the blood of Christ? Here's the point. Jesus will say that for us in verses 6 to 8, third point, a lot better than I just did. Here's the principle. Verse 6, last point. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Here's the principle. In other words, hear what he said. Consider how an unrighteous judge acted 
on behalf of this woman. Jesus expands it. If He is the epitome of wickedness, if that's what He said, God is the epitome of righteousness. This is a classic Hebrew way of arguing. From the lesser to the greater. If a corrupt guy, if a mean guy, if a stingy guy can come around to finally act favorably, how much more will a God who is just and loving and gracious and merciful act favorably? You see? Verse 7. Now, will not God bring about justice for His elect who cry to Him day and night? And will He delay long over them? Again, lesser to greater. If a widow who is characterized as helpless and insignificant to a judge gets favor from this wicked guy, how much more, as the text says, will God's elect? The judge looked at that widow and said, you are a waste of life. You could die tomorrow. As a matter of fact, I hope you do die tomorrow because then you'll leave me alone. Get out of here. I don't care if you're not getting what's deserved you. I don't care if I'm not helping you. I don't care if you walk out of this courtroom and you drop dead of starvation. I don't care. Is that how God views His children? The text says, God's elect. God's beloved children. God's children loved and called from the foundation of the earth. God's children written in the Lamb's book of life when those people that are loved by God more than we could ever imagine are, quote, crying out to Him in prayer day and night. Do you think He's going to ignore that? Moms and dads? Did you blow off your children? The Lord said, I'm coming back. That's the will of God. And when we desire His return, that is a desire to see Christ glorified. That's a good thing. You bet He hears that prayer. You bet He welcomes that prayer. You you bet He delights in us offering that prayer. And you bet He answers that prayer. Then where is He? Where is he? It's all that important to God and to me, then where is he? And what's the answer? First Peter chapter three. He is patiently waiting for the full number of his elect to come to salvation in Christ. And this is right in the context of what we learned last week, right? In 26 to 27 of chapter 17, I'm going to destroy the earth. Noah, preacher of righteousness, warn him, tell him I'm coming. There's a flood. Decades. Decades. That's God's patience. The days of Lot. Warning. You better get out of here. You better repent. Verses 28, 29, and 30. Where's God? He is waiting. You ever have something that you got to do? And it's the right thing to do? Maybe a letter you got to write somebody? And you're just burning to get this thing done with because it's so right and it's so pressing on your heart? Could you imagine if someone said, I want you to write that letter in 15 years from now? Kill you. The delay of Christ glorifies Christ. Because he's not like that unrighteous judge. He is not callous. He is not unmerciful. He is not frustrated. He is saying, this is what is going to happen. And I am showing you amazing patience, folks. And I'm doing it in delay because I love people. I'm calling my elect to myself. And when that last elect individual comes to repentance, I'm coming back with a vengeance. 
This glorifies his attributes of forbearance and mercy and love. I love Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness, again, unlike the unrighteous judge, he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He has clothed the robe, dipped in blood. The mighty warrior is the crucified lamb. And his name is called the word of God. And his armies, which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron and treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <laughs> Man, I want to see that. According to the word of God, that day is coming. And that day, all of our deepest desires will be met. And as we persevere in Christ, and as we wait, and as we suffer shame for his name, and as we commit ourselves to prayer, verse 8, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. In God's definition of quickly. Something jumped out at me this morning. Verse 7 and verse 8. I missed it in my study. I caught it this morning. Twice I see the word justice. This is so fascinating to me. It just jumped out at me. That you have a widow that came before this unrighteous judge... Who is God? Genesis 18, the judge of the earth that will always do what is right, right? You got this widow that comes before a judge who's supposed to be a man of justice, who deserved justice. She was right. She deserved justice and she didn't get it until the very end. And then it says here that we who do not deserve justice are promised that. It is the just thing that when we pray and we desire God's reign and His glory to be seen, it is the just thing of a just judge to grant that. But it's not done. However, look at the rest of this. Is, you would think it would end right there. It doesn't. However, the rest of verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, He's coming. But when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? Wow, that's powerful. God's coming back. He will return. He will be faithful to always keep his word. But when he comes back, whenever that is, will he find faith and faithfulness amongst the people that he has created to worship him? Amongst humanity. Now, stay with me on this. I've lived in this area about 20 years right now. And our kids, for the most part, have been involved in the public school. We got to know a lot of people. I try to get engaged in the community as much as I can. I got to know people in this area well. I try to talk to people. I remember one of the, one of the uh, moms I met with, the mom, maybe she's here right now, and... Uh, she says, my daughter sees you at the gym all the time. She goes, every time she sees you, you're always talking to somebody. I'm like, well, I, I kind of do work out every once in a while, but uh, I just try to meet people. I can't see hearts. I don't know who's saved. If someone blatantly denies Christ, I could say you're not saved, but I, I don't know. But what I do know is this, that if you take the, the portrait of a saved person, to me, to the Bible, I think, it's, it's like, 
It's like a person that's engaged in a good Bible teaching church. Someone says, I'm saved. I say, where do you go to church? Oh, I'm going to so-and-so church. Where I don't go. I'm like, okay, kind of weird. You read, you're saved. You read your Bible? Never picked it up. You want to talk about Jesus? No. Get, no, get that, get that away from me. You ever pray? Not really. You pursuing holiness? What does that mean? I'm pursuing the party next Friday night. That's what I'm pursuing. Maybe. But if, I mean, if that's kind of the, the portrait of a, a, a redeemed individual to some degree, some degree. And from what I know about society, the people I've interacted with, I'm going to come out and literally say, I, in, 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 in my interactions with people, if I had to bet on it, 1% at best in this area are born again. I laugh when you hear about missionaries. Oh, we're going to so-and-so. There's only 4% born again. 4%? There's no way this area is 4% born again. Right, I'll give you 2%. When Jesus comes back, will he find faith on this earth? Will he even find anybody that believes in him? It certainly seems that way, doesn't it? But that's not really what he's getting at here. He's getting at faithfulness. When he comes back and he's like, hey guys, I'm here. And the church is like, oh yeah. <laughs> I haven't really thought about that much. Yeah, no, we're good. We're good, Jesus. We're, yeah, no, 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 no. I'm ready to go with you. Yeah. Will he find people crying out day and night, as the text says, for his return? Will he find people excited about his return? Will he find people that have been looking forward to his return? Or will we have lost the greatness of the second coming? Will we have given up on prayer? Will we, in a sense, have really just given up on Jesus? Now, verse 1 makes sense. That we ought to pray and not lose heart. Because when we delight in the Lord, He gives us the desires of our heart. Father, we do delight in You and we thank You for Your promises. And uh, there's no doubt some promises are so clear in Scripture. They're repeated, Old Testament, frequently in the New Testament. And clearly this is one of them, that You are coming back. That this is the consummation. This is, this is the opportunity for You to ultimately glorify Yourself. This is Your most glorious event we could argue that you'll ever partake in. Uh, Lord, this is where you show your power, your omniscience, your omnipotence, your rightful reign over society. This is where you are displayed to all people who see you as king of all kings. This is where your will is done. This is where you consummate your incredible kingdom. This is when we are finally done away with sin, given resurrected bodies. This is what we live for. And Lord, forgive me for not living for it enough. Forgive me for not praying for it enough. Forgive me for at times wondering and, and doubting and not being excited about it, not looking forward to it. Maybe even argue, not even being fully prepared. Help us, Lord, as the verse says so clearly, to pray always and not lose heart, but specifically to pray for your return and not lose heart because you are a gracious, wonderful, loving Father to your elect. And Lord, how will you not hear us when we cry out day and night in our hearts to see you glorified? Because when we delight in you, that is the true desire that we will have within us. In Jesus' name, amen.